we've had quite a few. Oh. Okay. All right, well, welcome everybody to um, uh, this uh, book launch of Fractured China with one of the authors, Professor Lee Jones, it's co-authored with also Professor Shaha Hameri. Um, thank you everybody for joining us either live or um, later in the recorded version. Some of you may actually physically be in the building too. And if you are watching this on a projector, uh, welcome. Um, it's a real pr pleasure for me to um, host um, this book launch with Professor Lee Jones. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about him in a minute, a little bit about the book. The way we're going to do it today is we're going to have about 30 minutes of, the discuss of a discussion around the book that, that Lee, of course, will lead. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, I would encourage everybody to type in um, uh, their questions if they're online, if they're joining online, and then I'll, I'll come to those questions at the end. If you're not online and you're remote, um, I would then suggest there is, um, Lauren is in the room, um, and you raise your hand and ask Lauren so that you can ask a question. Um, and I'll sort of put you on the list at the end of, of the talk. Um, so as I say, it's, it's really a pleasure. It's a personal pleasure for me. We're not physically together in the room, but it's still a pleasure nonetheless to introduce Lee. Um, he's a professor of political economy um, and uh, international relations um, at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, he's a leading expert on political economy, uh, social conflict, state transformation in East Asia and Southeast Asia. He's written a number of books now on, on these topics, including uh, the fantastic, I'm gonna get my copy, um, Fractured China that's just recently come out. As Lee knows, um, I'm a huge intellectual fan of his work, um, which is why it's such a pleasure for me to, to, in, to introduce you today. And I think a lot of your work, um, Lee, not just the co-authored pieces, but you know, a lot of your work on sanctions, even earlier work on ASEAN, more recent work on rising powers, the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, a constant theoretical thread in that work um, is around um, the idea of state transformation. And I think this book, um, you know, is probably sort of the most um, comprehensive theoretical and empir empirical um, discussion um, of, of state transformation applied, applied to China. Um, so I'm not going to say much more now because I obviously want you to talk about your book um, and um, I will hand the floor over to Lee, but just to say a big, big thank you and a big welcome um, um, uh, today uh, at War Studies. So over to you, Lee. Thanks so much, Nicola, and especially for such a kind and warm uh, introduction. And I'm glad that you can see the, the coherence in my work. I'm not sure anybody looking at my CV uh, would necessarily uh, understand that it, it might seem a bit kind of erratic to other people but yes um, especially in my work with Shahar we've been developing this this idea of state transformation and the consequences that that has for for international relations um, and we've developed that framework to to look at, at China um, so I'm just I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes I'll give a brief kind of overview of the, the book the way we approach the topic, what the book's really about, and then um, a little bit of a uh, one of the case studies of, of, of the book. Um, so um, I'll start with a, with a vignette, um, which is about the record that China has on non-proliferation and, and, not, and North Korea. So on the one hand, the, the official Chinese policy is actually, to, is actually very close to that of the West. So they're very concerned about non-proliferation. They're very concerned about uh, North Korea's behavior and they have supported the United Nations sanctions on North Korea. And they've also supported bilateral measures that have um, isolated North Korea. So for example, it has not been able to join the Belt and Road Initiative or the um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank either. So on the one hand, China is committed to global norms and non-proliferation, the global regime around that. But on the other hand, Chinese investment in North Korea has risen quite considerably during this period when intensifying sanctions have been applied. And bilateral trade and investment has also um, increased considerably, particularly apparel exports from North Korea, as you can see in the figures there. 
And from time to time, you see local authorities along the border with North Korea periodically um, releasing, easing um, restrictions on tourism and, and trade across the border. And so a lot of observers have said, well, China's cheating. And President Trump said, um, tweeted that China had been caught red handed undermining UN sanctions. So you have apparently contradictory behavior on the part of the party state. On the one hand, China seems to support global counter proliferation efforts. On the other hand, it seems to be undermining them. So how do we make sense of an event like this? It's difficult for international relations, mainstream international relations theory, to make sense of this consistently inconsistent international behavior, because what we argue is this is not a unique example, but there are many, many examples that we, we cover in the book, some of them in, in great detail. The reason why international relations can't make much sense of these kind of contrary, contradictory behaviors is that at least in the rising powers debate in international relations, China is treated as a unitary actor. There's a long-standing um, tendency in IR theory to view states essentially as unitary actors. Um, that assumption has been relaxed in some areas, but particularly in the debate around rising powers, what they want, what they're going to do, what their impact is going to be on the uh, global order, that assumption still holds. And so what that leads to is, depending on your theoretical proclivities, the evidence that doesn't quite fit with your theory tends to get downplayed or ignored, or the evidence is twisted or shoehorned into a particular picture. So realists look at what China's doing on North Korea and saying, well, obviously China's grand strategy is really to keep propping up North Korea. And so it only gives uh, uh, lip service to global non-proliferation, really it's kind of propping up, up the regime. On the other hand, the liberals would, would be more likely to play up the cooperation that's happening. And they want to say that China is working within international institutions and so on and so forth. And what that means is the debate on rising powers, which is primarily really a debate about China, is very inconclusive. So on the, on the one hand, you get people that say, China is a revisionist power, it's committed to overthrowing the United States and wants to transform the international order. And then you get people that say, well, China is really a status quo power or it's just sleep, you know, seeking slight amendments to the international order. And because that debate is not res resolvable, we can't quite work out what China wants because it seems to say, seems to want different things. Uh, then the debate becomes more and more speculative. Okay, what is China gonna do in the future? So the, this is why the debate on rising powers is really at an impasse today. Um, there seems to be no way to decisively resolve this debate between the revisionist and the status quo camps, because there's actually evidence on both sides. And the evidence is being shoehorned, cherry-picked, selectively um, taken up. To take a deeper dive into this little vignette, why is it that there is apparent non-compliance with UN sanctions to which Beijing is apparently committed? That non-compliance is driven by companies, uh, for example, textile companies um, and provincial governments that are bordering North Korea or close to North Korea. So the companies engaged in tourism or trade or they want to offshore textile production to a lower wage economy. They're the ones that are engaged in essentially violating uh, the sanctions regime and defying effect effectively um, Chinese, uh, China's official foreign policy. And Beijing has largely reacted to these events. Beijing does not necessarily even know that these things are happening and is caught off guard when some problem is discovered. So this is about local actors within the party state doing things that have significant international repercussions that may diverge from commitments that Chinese diplomats have given in other contexts. So our argument in this book is relatively straightforward, really, which is that Chinese international engagements often exhibit inconsistent or even contradictory behavior today because China isn't a unitary international actor. Decades of state transformation involving the fragmentation, decentralization, and internationalization of party state apparatuses mean that many Chinese actors with often differing interests and agendas 
now operate internationally with considerable autonomy and limited coordination and oversight. This produces outcomes that don't necessarily reflect top leaders' agendas, which may themselves be unclear. So this is the fundamental argument of fractured China. Now, what I've just said will appear to many China experts as, as blatantly obvious, um, that China is not this monolithic entity where one person is in control of everything and everything that China does is strategically coherent. Um, and this reflects a really significant gap between the literature in Sinology or China studies, um, the study of particularly China's internal politics and international relations. So on the left, you have a couple of um, seminal texts from the late 1980s um, which, uh, and, and the early 90s, which reflect the emergence of what is, to a large extent, a consensus in China studies, which is the idea of China as so-called fragmented authoritarian state that no longer has this top-down command and control structure where a few people in the middle make all the big decisions, but has become much more fragmented over time. And some early studies, um, this book in uh, China Deconstructs, published in 1994, we're starting to think about the implications of that for China's foreign relations. So that's sinology on the one hand, but that as, you, as you can see on the other side, you have books in international relations tend to be constantly thinking about what is China's strategy? What, is the, what does China want? What is China doing? So there's this tendency in, when it comes to China's international engagement to still think about China as a unit. Um, and that implies a certain set of capabilities and capacities within the Chinese party state to uh, develop a grand strategy and to coordinate and prioritize and allocate resources according to, in some cases, some very long range plans. So these are some typical uh, titles. This, uh, there's this idea that China is such a powerful authoritarian regime and such a uh, coherent entity that it can play the long game, not like Western states that are constantly blown off course by democratic politics and are floundering around in the Middle East, but they have this long-term strategic vision, even over a hundred years, to gradually displace the United States. So there are just two very different understandings of what China is. At root, this is an ontological division over the way to understand what China is. And I suppose what fractured China is really trying to do is to bridge this gap because um, there is a disconnect and we have to understand why this is the case. For Sinologists, it is because China is such a big country and there's such a large community of scholars writing on China that it is possible to write only for other Sinologists. So they operate within a silo that is not really engaging, I think in many cases with the wider um, literature on political science and international relations more generally. And that allows them to treat the reform and opening up process in China as a sui generis um, development. So we don't need to understand this as part of a generalized tendency that's happening elsewhere and think about how, the, how what's going on in China might be an expression of more general tendencies. There's a singular focus on, on one state and how this works. And this is a curse, I think, of big country area studies. So there tends to be an absence of theoretical development and a lack of application of, of theory or comparative analysis. I'm generalizing, but I think this is, this is broadly true. Another problem is that IR theory has not provided them with good theoretical models that help them to communicate their findings about fragmented authoritarianism to the IR discipline itself. So they're forced to use um, quite weak uh, frameworks like, for example, the bureaucratic politics model from foreign policy analysis, uh, which really don't quite capture what's going on um, in, in the Chinese case. For IR itself, that is because there are still strong unitary reactor assumptions that are mentioned in the rising power debate. So these struggle to make sense of what is going on when, it, when there is a fragmented actor that is not part of the ontological baggage of IR theory. And theory that ties the domestic to the international, like two-level games or foreign policy analysis, for example, is 
is weakly developed to take account of fragmentation. It's only very recently, for example, in foreign policy analysis that people have started to take the idea seriously that the state might not be the same as it used to be in the classical era of you know, 1950s bureaucratic politics, um, that actually maybe the state has undergone some changes due to globalization. And in the book, we discuss this and show how they haven't really, um, although even, even the people that have acknowledged it, have not really developed any frameworks capable of making sense uh, of what's really going on. So we have, in fractured China, we have developed the state transformation approach, which as Nicola mentioned, is an approach that we've been using uh, in our work for some time. The foundation of this is to understand state, the state from a Gramscian approach, where the state is not a, an actor, but is a uh, institutional ensemble that reflects ongoing uh, social political conflicts in an evolving uh, political economy context. And from this perspective, we can see what's happening in China, not as something unique to China, but as part of a general phenomenon reflecting really big shifts in the global and local political economy. Um, now, these general tendencies always have localized expressions because states reflect the um, reflect proximate uh, socio-political conflict. But we would argue that what's happening in China is not um, is not entirely unique and can be used that can be understood using these general theoretical frameworks. So in China itself, this state transformation is underpinned by the shift from Maoism to capitalism, which has led to a shift in the party state class basis to um, networks of uh, cater capitalists, the politico business networks that constitute uh, state power in China, and the associated changes in the way the party state is organized. And we identify three different dynamics here. One is fragmentation, this means the dispersion of power, authority and resources across agencies at different levels. So, for example, you might have 11 different agencies engaged in um, maritime affairs, for example. Uh, as you'll see later, 40 agencies involved in, in 41 agencies involved in drugs policy, for example. So a, a, a lot of coherence in, in policy making and the frequent overlapping of authority. Decentralization is the second uh, is the second dynamic, which means the devolution of power, control over resources um, uh, to subnational governments. Particularly important are provincial uh, governments because they have um, they have responsibility now for China's for the foreign economic relations of of their provinces but there's so all the way down to the most local governments there are kind of foreign departments um, and then finally the internationalization of state apparatus this means uh, institutions that were initially developed purely for domestic purposes uh, now acquire an international role so state-owned enterprises are the most obvious one uh, these have become major international players and actors <clears throat> whose conduct is often seen to reflect directly on what the Chinese government wants but in reality, these are now operate at, at, at arm's length and are mostly uh, kind of quasi-autonomous, profit-motivated actors. Um, but many different parts of the party state now also have an international role. The Ministry of Public Security, for example, as we'll see later, has acquired an international role in counter-narcotics, uh, counter counter-piracy, and so on. And there are many other examples. So, in the context of this fragmentation, decentralization, internationalization, then the question then is, well, how, how does policy making and implementation work in China now? What we try to do in the book is avoid the debate that you find in lots of, um, a lot of Sinology about whether the center has lost power or whether it's still powerful. That's not the question of, of is it more or less powerful, but more how is power exercised? How does, how does politics work now within this transformed state? And what we argue is that there has been a shift from a command and control system where decisions are made at the center and the responsibility of different agencies is to, is to simply implement the will of the center to what we call the Chinese star regulatory state. In a regulatory state, the center has withdrawn from 
directly making detailed decisions that, and controlling the output of the party state directly to a much looser style of coordination where the center sets out broad parameters, broad regulations, uh, broad objectives, um, but it is left to a whole host of other actors within the party state to, uh, to develop more detailed plans and to translate these very broad guidelines into um, reality. So the center has various regulatory mechanisms uh, that influence and steer how these different actors are to behave. These are, include party ideology or campaigns, the statements or slogans issued by uh, senior, senior leaders, so important speeches or catchphrases, like at the moment the, the catchphrase du jour is um, common prosperity. Um, they, use, um, they use coordinating committees or bodies to try to pull together the different agencies working within particular issue areas. So leading small groups of the state council or the Politburo the Central Committee and various uh, party state commissions to try to coordinate policy making in a particular area. They of course have discretionary control over <clears throat> laws, regulations and funding, which other, um, other uh, actors within the party state might well need. And the most important of all are the, are the, are the Communist Party's own powers of appointment, um, appraisal and discipline over uh, Communist Party members. All of these things uh, orient other actors towards the center and constrain these actors to at least at least present their behavior as compatible with the kind of things that the center wants them to do. But it does not equate to monolithic control of all the different actors within the party state. Others can engage in what we call the three eyes, influencing. Uh, they can influence all of the things I've just talked about in a variety of ways. They might be part of these leading small groups, for example. They might lobby for um, legal changes, funding, disbursements. Um, these things often bubble up from below. They can interpret these broad guidelines. When statements, for example, are made by top leaders, it's often incredibly vague and loose and require careful uh, interpretation into, uh, to flesh them out into more uh, detailed policy directives. Um, and uh, at a pinch, they may ignore what the center has told them to do. They may ignore laws and regulations. So the behaviors that Chinese party state acts engage in reflect ongoing contestation within this Chinese style regulatory state. Uh, and in, in my view, we could discuss this more in Q&A if necessary. This means that it's actually very difficult for Chinese, for the Chinese party state to engage in the development of a grand strategy um, because the, the party state simply does not have the kind of coherence and tight central control that will be required uh, to, to enact grand strategy. Now, the final plank of the state transformation approach is that if we're not just interested in explaining the party state's behavior, but we're interested in explaining the outcomes of that behavior internationally, then we have to understand how these dynamics on the Chinese side intersect with those in uh, target states. So we have to look at the key actors, interests and agendas that are operating from China and how these intersect with local, uh, local interests, actors and agendas in states that are targeted by Chinese initiatives. And these are often contested within recipient societies because they have uneven distribution of political consequences. And the case studies that we uh, consider in the book are the South China Sea, uh, non-traditional security, with particular reference to counter narcotics and riverine banditry, and finally, international development financing, focusing on uh, hydropower dams in the Mekong subregion. And the case that I would like to briefly run through um, is non-traditional security focusing on counter narcotics just to show how this framework operates. So the conventional narrative that you would find on counter narcotics is that increasingly drug flows from the Golden Triangle into China have been uh, securitized as a threat to China. And that led to the declaration of a people's war on drugs declared by President Hu in 2000 
And that has led, among other things, to a rollout of opium substitution projects in drug producing neighboring states. And we've seen China actively participate in the UN Office on, of Drugs and Crime uh, Memorandum of Understanding on Drug Control, which is the regional framework for, um, for uh, cooperation on counter narcotics in the Mekong area. And that has led to the, the incorporation of various progressive UN principles on alternative development, uh, which is another word for, for opium substitution. And the existing literature on this is quite scant, but it tends, it tends to praise this as a massive success. And it's possible to, pray, to, to pass this from a realist or liberal perspective. Realists would say this is about China kind of mobilizing to tackle an international threat and acting in its own self-interest. Liberals would emphasize the, the way that China is being incorporated into UN-led institutions in the region. From a state transformation perspective, the story is very different. So, Opium substitution projects did not begin at the top. Um, they are they reflect the bottom up influencing, reflecting decentralization. So opium substitution projects actually began, they were pioneered by a county level government, neighboring Myanmar in the early 1990s. It was then scaled up to uh, a provincial level policy by Yunnan in the, in the mid 1990s. And they lobbied the central government to adopt this as a, as a national policy to get more funding um, and policy support from Beijing. So uh, rather than being a national strategy, this is something that emerged um, bottom up. National drug policy making has become very fragmented in, in China. There are 41 different agencies involved in the um, National uh, Narcotic Control Council. Um, the Ministry of Public Security is the lead agency domestically, and it tries to coordinate these bodies within, the, within this uh, council. And it's also leading um, China's, uh, uh, China's representation in regional UN processes. So the, the MPS has internationalized to, to, to lead on this issue in the region, and that has produced this regulatory framework that, as I say, incorporates many progressive principles on uh, for example, consulting local communities, being very inclusive, environmental sustainability, and so on, in opium substitution. But interestingly, and this is a sign of further fragmentation, when it came to the opium substitution program, 21 different agencies uh, came together and they were assembled into the 122 work group, which was led not by the Ministry of Public Security, but by the Ministry of Commerce. And they set up the regulatory mechanism for opium substitution. Now, reflecting the, the shift to the Chinese style regulatory state, that led to just broad targets for the acreage of plantations um, and that the main instruments that would be used would be uh, tax breaks on imports and so on. So it's a very business oriented um, regulatory framework and the UN principles to which the Ministry of Public Security committed China were neglected in this framework. An implementation of opium substitution was then decentralized to the Yunnan Department of Commerce. And that led to local uh, cater capitalists interpreting the opium substitution scheme around local dominant business interests, particularly agribusiness interests, and ignoring the uh, MPS and UN guidelines. So that, what that has led to in practice is that these opium substitution projects have been hijacked by local uh, agribusiness um, interests expanding into neighboring Southeast Asian countries. And they're basically using this as a way to subsidize that expansion. So those business interests, some of which are state owned, some of which are now privatized, but retain strong links to local um, Communist Party caters, they have internationalized to become the main implementing agencies of supposed central government policy. And what that means is that their commercial interests have trumped strategic ones, particularly when it comes to what crops would be used and where they would be placed. So the big boom crop with the first um, kind of big wave of opium substitution in the mid 2000s was rubber, because rubber firms were running out of land in China and there was booming demand for rubber. The problem is that rubber doesn't grow at the same elevation as opium. So you cannot take an opium um, plantation and swap it out for a rubber plantation. So 
basically from the very beginning, the whole idea of opium substitution was, was, very, was very dubious, given the interests that were actually driving this. Now, in terms of specific outcomes, it reflects the intersection of these actors and interests with those in the target state. In the Myanmar context, as people will know, the context in the borderlands, neighboring China, is that the state's control there is also very fragmented with lots of um, ethnic minority militias, some of them allied to the regime, some of them in ceasefires, and some of them still fighting against the regime. So the result of this is that when these Chinese agribusinesses came in, they partnered with local elites, whether that's military, uh, ethnic, ethnic minority militias or the ethnic minority armed groups and engaged in land grabbing to establish um, plantations which led to forced displacement, the use of forced labor and the proletarianization of subsistence farmers. All of these violated the UN principles to which the Ministry of Public Security had committed China. The outcome of this is that it enriched the narrow elite that were involved, the local elites in Myanmar and the agribusinesses um, involved. But actually, opium cultivation overall rose, as did drug seizures in China. So you can see on the top left that during the biggest period of um, opium substitution um, projects going out from China, opium cultivation increased. And with a, sh a short time lag, uh, the seizures of heroin and opium in China also increased. So uh, I don't really have time to run through the, the full uh, detail of the, uh, of, the, of the case study and other case studies, but I thought I might just um, uh, read out this uh, quotation from one of our informants, who was a retired, very, very senior counter-narcotics official in Myanmar, because his, his uh, recollections show what happens when another state encounters this kind of behavior, they're on the receiving end of this kind of behavior, and, and then they encounter fractured China in trying to push back against it. So he says, we got very fed up and we said very bluntly to the Chinese, this is not the kind of development we want. They, the agribusinesses, are cheating us and they're cheating you. They're lying to you, telling you they're doing development. But these guys in Beijing, they don't know anything. And he's talking about the Chinese National Narcotics Control Commission, which is under the Ministry of Public Security. So that's his interlocutor as a foreign counter-narcotics official. And they told him, we have no control over commerce and agriculture. So this is one of the big flaws. We should have direct access to them. But these public security people, they're committed to trying to help us, but they're relying on the private sector who are not sincere at all. Profit is the main thing for them. But they said, that's not not our business, it's the mandate of another ministry, in this case, Ministry of Commerce. He says, I don't blame them in Beijing, I blame Yunnan, the provincial government. We're neighbors, we know them well. Beijing lives in another world. Yunnan knows all about us, but they're not sincere. The autonomous provinces, they listen to Beijing, but they have their own independent way of doing things. So uh, it's important to say that this has not radically changed under Xi Jinping either because this is sometimes a, a frequent response to our research is that, well, it might have been true in the past, but it's not true anymore today because Xi Jinping controls everything, having re-centralized uh, everything. But these problems are ongoing under him. So there is continued land grabbing under the cover of opium substitution projects. Um, bananas and sugar cane are the new boom crop. And this has led to additional problems in Myanmar and Laos of soil degradation, the poisoning of livestock, and serious health problems among farmers, particularly um, cancers. And meanwhile, as you can see in this uh, diagram um, on the dotted line, these opium substitution projects have obviously done nothing to suppress the production of methamphetamine type um, stimulants. So it's not, contrary to what people say, a success. And it's also not easily passed by realism or liberalism. So the Ministry of Public Security is sincere when it commits China to UN principles, but it is not in control of opium substitution practices. Um, neither, frankly, is the Ministry of Commerce in Beijing. The real people really in control are local agribusiness interests and their political uh, patrons in Yunnan province. So this outcome is explicable through a state transformation approach, but not through conventional IR theory. Right, I think I better wrap up there and, uh, and we can take uh, questions Thanks very much, Lee. Um, I'm going to abuse my position uh, and, and sort of 
have some, I have some starter questions of my own, um, just because it's such an opportunity. Um, I would just like to say that having read the book and, and it is out now, um, is I think you probably don't promote yourself as much as you probably could in this area, but it, it, it does a great job, I think, of going beyond a leader focused approach to Shiner, right? I mean, you say that just now, but, but it, you know, it, you do a great job of sort of going beyond, you know, it's not simply what China wants, but a lot of the conversation is what does Xi Jinping want? Like what does, you know, and is Xi Jinping the new Mao kind of thing? And, and that sort of language and that sort of um, narrative is very predominant in, in, in IR, particularly in US China circles and grand strategy circles. And it also sidesteps the reform period because if you're linking Mao, um, linking Xi to you know, Mao, you're forgetting the middle part, which is, as you say, hugely important to the story of, of state transformation and, and China to regulatory state. So I think, you know, actually, <clears throat> there's a lot of other reasons as well, I think that could be highlighted here for reading your book beyond um, you know, its validity as a, as a theoretical um, approach to sort of, you know, bridge that gap. Two really cheeky questions, I think. But the first is um, to push you a little bit more as to why this China monolith um, approach persists. I mean, you do a, a great job at laying out sort of the, pol the polarizing between, you know, the, the situation between sinologists and, and, and IR um, people. But it seems to me that in this discussion around US-China particularly, um, and, and particularly around grand strategy. I mean, is it because, um, you know, the China conversation in that area is becoming increasingly crowded out by non-China, China, China experts, right? And I'm talking here about grand strategists, right? Who think they can apply grand strategy, you know, um, universally as it were, right? Um, um, and the explosion of grand strategy, of course, as a discipline, right? Or, or as, a, as, a, as a field of inquiry. Uh, or is it also because I think your approach, if applied, is probably going to be harder to do. It makes China harder <laughs> to understand. But I'm just I'm just throwing out a couple of ideas there. The second question is a bit more substantive, and it's about the regulatory state. Mm. Um, if I if I focus on the case study that you talked about in 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 the presentation, um, you do in in the book talk about a particular incident in 2011. Um, where um, you know Chinese cargo ships were attacked right um, on the Mekong, and that led to a public outcry in China. So my question is about what what is the role of public opinion in 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 the case of China as a regulatory state? You know there was a recent book by Andrea Gaselli that I think did a fairly good job at sort of you know developing that a bit more. And, and similarly, you know just as it is for public opinion, what about the role of history, right? And of course, your, your focus is very much coming, I think, from a political economy angle, so I don't think it's very fair of me, but in your case in the book around the South China Sea, what role of history here, right, um, in, in, you know, the maps and so forth um, um, in, in this idea of a regulatory state. So if, if we can start with those and then um, hopefully move forward. But thanks, Lee. Thank you. And, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the way that you characterise the IR discussion of China is, is, is absolutely correct um it is often i mean i when i discussed the belt and road initiative i have a i have a a slide where i show you know the the, the depictions of the belt and road initiative as kind of a, a tentacles you know spreading out from um from beijing and, and compare that to earlier cold war propaganda and i also have a, a kind of mock-up image of xi jinping as um, as blofeld uh the bond villain you know, because there is this such this kind of monomaniacal focus on on him and what he wants and what he's doing, what he's thinking, um, that you know, it's as if he's this superman, this godlike figure who can control everything in China. And um, you know, one one of my interlocutors in China said to me, uh, you know, to control all this, it would take a god. But the problem is, we don't have a god. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping cannot single-handedly reverse decades of state transformation in China. Um, and that all this talk about Xi as the new Mao is, is very unhelpful, because if you look at what Xi Jinping is actually doing, he's making use of those coordinating mechanisms that I mentioned earlier on. That's all he's doing. He's not, he's not actually innovated in the governance of China. He's just using all of these mechanisms which have been available to his predecessors and have also been used by them at various times. Now, he's a very forceful player of that game, no doubt about that, the most forceful for decades. Um, and he's doing it for, for reasons we can, we can go into if people are interested. But um, that, 
doesn't mean that the system was fundamentally transformed under him. In all of our chapters, we show actually considerable continuity and the struggle that Xi Jinping has in, in, in making things operate differently. Um, why does this monolithic idea persist? I think there's a number of different things. You touched on some of them yourself. One is the nature of the Chinese party state itself. I mean, it is authoritarian and it is quite opaque. So it projects this image of being this monolith. You know, Xi Jinping says common prosperity. Everybody rushes to say, oh yes, let's do common prosperity. I mean, we might not know what it means, but hey, you know, we can repackage what we're doing as, as being in line with the common prosperity and all the terrified, you know, tech elites start donating billions to, to, to various projects. That is, you know, that is, kind of terrifying to many people in the West. And it appears to give this image of tight, coordinated, top-down control. And no doubt the Chinese party state likes to cultivate that image. So in, in many ways, like, you know, these Western commentaries along these lines, they're just doing the party state's propaganda work for it. Um, I do think you're right about uh, China specialists being crowded out in the IR discussion. I mean, it's quite explicit in some of the grand strategy stuff that people say, I'm not writing as, as, as a sinologist. You know, I don't need to know about those things. You know, I just look at its international strategic behavior. And that I think speaks to the need that human beings have for relatively simple heuristics. So you are absolutely right. They would take massively you know, in the, in the recommendations to policymakers at the end, to take this model seriously as a way to understand Chinese behavior and to plan policy responses requires enormous amounts of nuance, enormous amounts of uh, data gathering, and therefore much more investment in smart diplomacy uh, than is currently the case. So in, in a sense, that gets put into the too hard box. I, and I do think that has got to do with the craving that human beings have for relatively simple, straightforward heuristics. This is too complicated. Um, and IR theorists have sort of played along with that in talking about you know, elegance, um, uh, parsimony, you know, as being, as being the thing to do. Um, and, and therefore, let's just, let's just deal with units. You know. On regulatory state, you know, public opinion and history, I think the easiest way, to, that's a very complicated question, but the easiest way for me to address it is to talk about the South China Sea. So, um, in the South China Sea case, what we argue is the regulatory framework around the South China Sea it comes from two main things. One is this idea of the nine dash line, the historical, you know, these maps, which are mostly fabricated from the 1930s onwards, um, which is very vague. Like, what does the nine dash line mean? Does it mean that China claims the sea in that line? Does it mean that they claim just the island? So sometimes it seems to be one thing and sometimes it seems to be another. It's deliberately vague. Uh, and then the other thing, the other kind of regulatory idea is, is the idea of Wei Chuan and Wei Wen, which is um, maintaining stability and maintaining maritime rights. And the idea is that actors are supposed to balance between these principles. But obviously, these are actually at times mutually exclusive. There's no sense of how you're supposed to balance between these things. So what you actually get is kind of wild oscillation within that framework. Sometimes very aggressive behavior, sometimes very diplomatic behavior by different actors, often at the same time. So it's consistently inconsistent. Now, one thing that the Chinese could do very concretely to, um, to reduce the propensity for conflict in the South China Sea is to clarify what the nine dash line means. Uh, but they don't do it. Now, one of the reasons they don't do it is that it is that if they are going to stick to their unclossed commitments, it would mean uh, trading off all this stuff around historical rights and so on, which I think in terms of public opinion and history, the way that the South China Sea has been kind of mythologized in uh, nationalist propaganda and education and so on, now makes it very difficult for Chinese leadership to climb down on the South China Sea. And there's lots of literature about you know, especially peak crisis moments that the, the leadership basically, because it legitimizes itself through continued economic growth and nationalism, finds it very difficult to back down and compromise. And I think this is how it, that plays out very concretely in the case of the South China Sea. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Lee. Um, we have um, a question from Mark Chan, so I'm going to read that out. So um, he says, thank you for the presentation. He's excited to read the book. He's curious about the influence of the business sector 
um, on Chinese foreign policy. Um, and he mentions here the agribusinesses um, in Yunnan. Have you observed similar influence wielded by big businesses on the central government and the PSC? Can, can the clampdown on big tech and finance firms in China be seen uh, as a pushback by Xi Jinping against their influence? Yeah, we, um, that's a very good question. Um, I, definitely, there is state-owned enterprises are a significant um, interest group within the party state, very diverse interest group, because obviously there's only about 100 centrally owned state-owned enterprises left now because they've been consolidated into these huge conglomerates um, and the rest, about 144,000, are subnational, So they're under subnational government. Um, the big central ones, I think, in many ways are, you know, very, very powerful. Um, and they can engage in influencing, interpreting and ignoring. And there are many documented instances of this. Um, probably the most widely explored are the national oil companies, the national energy companies, are very big players in lobbying government. They have you know, direct access, some of their chairmen are still retain uh, vice ministerial rank, so they have direct access to um, policy makers and senior bureaucrats. Um, uh, they're able to, to push their agendas into policy frameworks, they're able to get central backing for their plans to expand into other countries. That's happened with the hydropower sector, for example. So one of the case studies that I've been interested in and is in the book um, is the case of the Mietzon Dam in, in, uh, in Myanmar, which really blew up in um, 2011 when the Myanmar government suspended it amid uh, widespread national uh, protests against the dam. And this is often seen as a kind of strategic push by China to, to you know, move its hydropower dams into neighboring rivers and extend its sort of territorial control. What we show in that chapter is actually this is the result of bottom-up activity by um, state-owned hydropower companies that are running out of sites in China and need to internationalize and they've lobbied the center to back their business plan and at the same time neighboring governments want these dams these dams were requested they're the idea of neighboring governments and the Chinese um, companies are stepping in to fill that gap and make money and then they get uh, top leaders to come in and sign some kind of, you know, uh, shiny framework agreement and make it look like it's this great interstate agreement, but it's not. The, the centre is just giving its imprimatur to the, the bottom-up activities of companies, which are just in it for the money. Um, and then when there's local protest, it's all against China because it's a state-owned company, so it must be directed by the central government. You know, what's China doing? They're colonising us, et cetera, et cetera. And it blows up into a major diplomatic incident. So there are many cases where you can um, where you can uh, see that happening. On the tech clampdown, this is not my area of expertise um, at all. But um, the tech companies are just as opportunistic, I think, as, as the rest. Um, the stuff around the digital um, digital Silk Road and all that kind of stuff, I think, shows how they are able to bandwagon on these broad, capacious policy envelopes. Uh, for their own advantage. My sense is that the, the tech clampdown is um, uh, Xi Jinping reminding the private sector that it exists at the sufferance of the party state, broadly speaking, um, and that they ought to be more deferential to, um, to party diktat, and that this is a potential, the tech sector in particular, because it has such sort of cartelistic control over certain certain areas of the Chinese economy, like online payments and uh, transportation and, and you know, the emerging kind of fintech stuff. It's an area where, you know, private enterprise is always potentially an area in which an alternative power base might emerge within the political economy. I mean, it never really has in China um, because they're, they're basically happy with the, the party state that has nurtured them. But when, when Jack Ma starts making remarks about you know, um, how backwards Chinese policymakers are, then that sort of open defiance against the party state is not um, tolerated in the, new, in the new regime. So I think this is mostly about sort of cutting them, the tech oligarchs down, down to size, reminding them who's in charge. 
and it's it's one of the regulatory mechanisms that's available uh, to them you know they can direct regulators to go and investigate the affairs or they can block ipos or they can etc etc thanks lee i'm gonna i'm gonna um put two last questions together um or maybe just one last one that's coming now i think the first one sort of piggybacks a bit on what you just said about sort of she um and the, and the sort of central uh, elites trying to regain um, some power and it's about the anti-corruption campaign and is it an attempt to sort of centralize decentralization and if that's an effective tool as it were um there's also um a question from john Deval, um which is about you know i guess bringing evoking history here and saying is this a case that state transformation is, is sort of taking us back to the future and the example of state of affairs in the 19th century you know where foreign policy is not restricted to the center but actually company states um as it were you know um and so sort of applying that and you know he he, he has here in other words is all ir theory that is developed around foreign policy analysis um which understands the state as a unitary actor actually the historical exception rather than than the norm and then the last question here from romaine galix um he also thanks you for the talk um, it's quite common in the West to say that Beijing and maybe coastal elites are disconnected from sort of real development questions and the, and the reality of the country, um, and that their assertive attitude is premature and not in line with the country's needs and abilities. Would you would you say your observations confirm this disconnected elite um, thesis? Right. So, firstly, on the anti-corruption campaign, I mean, yes, I think that. I mean, this is quite common uh, in authoritarian regimes that anti-corruption campaigns are used as part of factional struggle and also to, to centralize control. And I think that is just that that is part of the CCP's powers of discipline, which I mentioned as one of the regulatory mechanisms. So obviously, Xi has been a very powerful player of that game, but that's what that is really about, I think. Yes. But this goes back to why he's doing all this, which is that this decade of sort of drift and dissolution and fragmentation and the corruption that has come with the interpenetration of business and the party state is that I think he genuinely thinks that CCP rule is in danger and he must try to impose greater discipline uh, and remind the party state that it's there to serve the people and the, the objectives of the people and not simply to serve uh, a self-aggrandizing elite. And I think he sees that as an existential question. And that's his mission to sort of save the party state from itself. Um, on John's question, uh, so I think your, your the question is half right. So it is not ever a case of going back to the future, uh, going back in time, because history doesn't go backwards, right? Time is linear, but this is we experience it as limited human beings. Um, so in a sense, it's not going back to sort of imperial China, for example, where there's a sort of weak center and then lots of warlords or whatever, because people have asked me that before as well. Um, because in the interim, you've had the creation of a powerful centralized state apparatus and state owned economy, which, okay, that has been transformed during the reform era, but it's not like you just wipe that out and go back to the, the status of it in imperial uh in imperial times now that's not the case you're dealing now with the legacy of the maoist system right so all the inter infrastructure of the party state is still there in revised form but it is used and it can affect outcomes in a way that you know those mechanisms are not available to rulers of imperial china or other empires at the time so it's not quite the same the half where I think you are right is that the, the period of the, the, there is a historical process of the consolidation of the nation state from empires and other transnational polities into you know territorially bounded sort of power containers to the extent that they ever were from roughly the 1940s to roughly the 1970s and then they start to sort of unbundle and transform and become sort of post-national, post-Westphalian. And the argument here is that China, China has experienced that to an extent. It's not simply a Westphalian power paving the way back to Westphalia, as many people um, suggest. But 
um, uh, it is true, therefore, that if you think about imaginaries that we have about the way the state works, the way politics works, the way we should theorize international relations, these are all legacies of that peak period of statism from the 40s through to the 70s. And it's remarkable how powerful the sort of imaginaries and the sort of common sense is that it's, it's really stuck with us. If you think about sort of social expectations about the way the state should work and how governance should work and how the state should provide for its citizens and so on, they're all legacies of that period, even though that era has actually gone to a large extent. So increasingly, in my work, the more work I do, the more I apply this framework to this different issue areas, the more I see that period from the 40s to the 70s as the exception and not the rule. But that doesn't mean that we're going back to the way that things were before the state because we're living in the shadows. We're living in the ruins, if you like. Not ru ruins is a, bit, is a bit far, but we're living in the legacy of a period when there were powerful, centralized developmental states that, were, that existed to develop their national economies, national welfare states, reduce uneven development within their borders, et cetera. And we have those institutions still around to a certain extent, revised, now promoting global competition in certain parts of their economies into global production networks. It's a very different world to, to that of the 19th century. Um, and then finally, the question on um, about disconnected elites, rural, you know, coastal elites and so on. My, my hunch of the, from my case study, it's not that uh, coastal elites are the ones that are being assertive and, and, and premature. Um, the, the, the ones, the, 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 the provincial governments that are causing the most bother internationally are the, are the more economically backwards ones. Um, Hainan province is a major irritant in the South China Sea because it is engaged not in sea grabbing, but land grabbing. Uh, it notionally has authority over the entire South China Sea. So it has, it has a strong incentive in saying, well, that means you know, all of that area belongs to us and we can regulate it and we can grab it for our fishing industry and so on. And it engages in very provocative behavior, which embroils China in conflict with other um, with other neighboring countries. And Yunnan province is, is just as bad, but with relation to mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, and there's been you know, various purges of Yunnanese um, uh, cadres as a result of all this sort of freewheeling activity under, under Xi Jinping. But the evidence is that in, in many respects, it, it continues. Um, the coastal states, if we're talking about you know, places like uh, Fujian and, um, you know, Shanghai and, and, and so on, then I would say that these have more of an interest in international stability and more interest in the status quo um, because they're so heavily dependent on flows of international trade and, and investment. And that's generally the way that China specialists have understood it is that the, the, more, the, the more sort of inland provinces have a more sort of conservative approach and, and the coastal provinces have a more a more liberal approach. Um, it would be good to see um, more investigations of that of that hypothesis to try to sort of tease out what are the regional differences um, and have they have they changed now that Xi Jinping, for example, is rotating personnel and, and stuffing his loyalists into um, provincial level administrations. I mean, there's so much to explore. This, you know, fractured China is about opening up a a research agenda for IR scholars. And there's so much that, that, that can be studied that we could only really begin to, to, to study in, a, in this exploratory study. Thanks, Lee. I think that's a really great way to end <clears throat> today's talk in terms of you know, where, where do we move forward with the theory that you're advancing in the book and particularly the sort of comparative at a provincial, provincial sub-state level um, analysis of, of, of China's behavior and, and sort of, um, uh, approaches. Um, there are some questions about COVID. I know that in your book at the end, in the conclusion, you do talk about sort of the politics around that in China. I even had a question about this so-called wolf warrior diplomacy. We don't have time for any of that, unfortunately, um, but uh, we do have time to thank you and also to encourage everyone to buy your book, um, read your book. Um, I think, as I say, as I said at the beginning, it advances in a 
in a really comprehensive manner this approach, a tough approach, a difficult approach, but perhaps you know, an approach that helps us to understand the incoherences of China a little bit better. So thank you very much, um, Lee, for joining us and for talking about your book, Fractured China, out with Cambridge University Press now. Thank you very thank much, Lee. It's been a great pleasure. Take care.